going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome you guys all here and welcome the South Carolina Association of Realtors. I think we have a couple of their attorneys online, but their general counsel, Byron King, is going to present to us today and talk a little bit about South Carolina forms. I sent over a list of questions ahead of time on terminations and contingencies and different nuances of that form, including repair procedures. He's gonna go through the nuts and bolts of what you need to know. He'll probably answer any questions. If you have questions, if you'll put them in the chat so that we can do them in a constructive order and we don't interrupt as he's walking through because we wanna get the most out of this. And if for some reason we don't answer your question while we're on live, we will certainly get you an answer as soon as possible after this Zoom call. But I wanna introduce and welcome Byron King to discuss with us. He is the general counsel, as I mentioned, for South Carolina Realtor Association. He has a tremendous amount to do, if not all to do with creating these forms. And so anything that we can glean from him will help us best represent our clients and understand how to move forward and be as effective as possible as we work in South Carolina. Welcome, Byron. Thank you so much for coming today. Hey, Tiffany. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting me. If uh, if you're able to turn your camera on, I know we didn't put out uh, to turn your camera on, but if you're in a position to turn your camera on, please do that so everybody can see each other and have a little bit of social camaraderie. Uh, if you're driving, make sure you pull over to a safe place. And um, so I'm going to go through. I'm going to take over the screen here. Let's see, it looks like somebody else has got control. So it says Brandy Mercer has started screen sharing. So there you go. Okay, let's see. All right, so this is, uh, uh, and Tierra's on here, I'll introduce Tierra as well. But uh, so we're the attorneys, we're in Columbia, South Carolina. This is me on the left, Austin Smallwood on the right, Tierra's on the call, she'll introduce herself here in a second. So we basically run the forms uh, we did the legal hotline. We're in Columbia, South Carolina. We're just, uh, if you come down I-77 South uh, and then you were to get on uh, I-26 westbound uh, right after that, uh, well, you get on I-20 and then I-26. We're on I-26 over by Columbiana Mall. So if you're ever in the area, uh, please stop by. We have a realtor office after the pandemic. And uh, so we do lobbying and uh, uh, legislative and legal for the realtors. We do professional standards for the state of South Carolina. Uh, we produce these forms. We do a legal hotline. That's our phone number there, 803-772-5206. You can email us with any kind of legal license law questions, ethics questions, fair housing questions. Um, and we'll, we'll, uh, it helps us too because it helps us improve the forms when we get questions or feedback from you all that use these forms in the field. Uh, so that's our contact information. My background information, I was a Went to USC Law School, was a closing attorney for a while, uh, worked at an appraisal brokerage, uh, opened a, we opened a mortgage company. So I've been involved in real estate for a long time, been at the association for a long time. So fairly experienced in real estate, and bought and sold a few houses. So what I was going to do is uh, we have a fair housing conference coming up uh, April 13th. So please register for that. It'll count toward your uh, 2.5 NAR ethics hours uh, due by New Year's Eve this year. Uh, fair housing's a, a hot uh, issue. Uh, in 2019, if you haven't seen it yet in Long Island, there was an undercover uh, video sting of real estate agents caught on camera steering uh, people by their race and national origin into certain neighborhoods of Long Island, New York. Um, and so we never want that to happen in North Carolina or South Carolina. So we're trying to educate realtors to treat everybody the same, not to discriminate in your real estate practice. Uh, Tara Pitts is on the call. She's been recently hired uh, as our fair housing policy uh, director. Uh, she's an attorney, also a Gamecock, and um, she's being trained to also do the legal hotline and her professional standards. So there'll be four attorneys on staff. We have 12 staff members. So a third of them are attorneys. So our CEO, Nick Kremitis, an attorney, myself, Byron King, Austin Smallwood, and Tara Pitts are all attorneys. So um, say hey to Tara in the chat, please. She's a uh, just on board for a few weeks. So she's learning, uh, learning rapidly. And a lot of this stuff is not rocket science, but it is a lot of information. So I do feel your pain uh, working in the Charlotte market. There's pros and cons that, right? It's a great market making lots of money, uh, but you have to learn state law for North Carolina and South Carolina. You got to learn forms for North Carolina and South Carolina. So it can be a challenge. So I do understand your, how confusing all this is. All right, uh, and then 
we'll go into the presentation here. So uh, this is our, our website, screaltors.org. This is the forms page as in a South Carolina Association of Realtors. You also have uh, Zip Forms Plus, which gives you, if you have a self, your mobile phone with you, uh, you've got all your files in your pocket or your purse. Uh, you can pull up and do mobile uh, real estate just using your uh, smartphone or your laptop or your tablet. Uh, you've got Zip Vault with all your files travel with you in the cloud. You've got unlimited uh, e-signatures with Zip Forms Digital Inc. Uh, that saves you money on time, saves you money on UPS, FedEx shipping. Uh, it's all done securely through the Zip Forms Lone Wolf product. But this website is a backup. You can go in here and pull up, you know, forms and print them out. Uh, but the Zip Forms, what you want to do, if you're a new agent, probably is uh, get a couple of your friends, one to pretend to be a buyer, one to pretend to be a seller and set up a, a whole hypothetical example into your Zip Forms account, open it up as a Zip Forms member, it's free. Uh, open it up and just run it just like you would a transaction and keep doing it to get proficient at it. We've got videos on how to use the Zip Forms technology. There's trainers throughout the Carolinas that come into your office and train you. Uh, lots of videos on YouTube, but you really don't learn until you practice it or maybe find somebody in your office that's good at technology and see how they're, they're doing their electronic forms because your clients are going to expect you to be technologically capable, especially during the pandemic. Uh, this is a contactless way to handle uh, paper forms. And then getting into the uh, presentation. So I know I've only got your attention for a short while, uh, so I try to put the most important stuff at the beginning. So one thing I want to make you aware of is in South Carolina, there's this form that's fairly new, but it has to be used every time. Uh, if you're a listing agent, your seller either uh, rejects an offer or lets it expire. So as a listing agent, you're always going to be sending something to the buyer, buyer side, either an accepted offer uh, or you're rejecting the offer or you're rejecting all the offers and you're going to do highest and best multiple offers or you're countering or if you're expiring, you're sending this form. So this form 314 offer rejection form is always sent by the listing agent to the buyer side unless the seller accepts or counter offers. And the idea being, if you're a buyer's agent, you've all been in this position, you send an offer and you don't hear from anybody and you get kind of nervous. Uh, hey, did my offer get submitted? Did you get lost in the fax machine? Did it get lost in the spam filter of their email? Uh, you call the other agent, they're not picking up the phone, you're going into voicemail. So to cure that issue, um, uh, the Real Estate Commission, the South Carolina General Assembly passed a law that realtors Real estate agents have to use this offer rejection form. It's form 314. So for a listing agent, uh, you should be very familiar with this form. If you haven't ever seen this form, you've been breaking the law. So make sure you use this form from now on going forward. It's the offer rejection form. So the listing agent will always send this to the buyer side unless the seller is accepting an offer or counter offering an offer. Because if you're the buyer agent and you get an accepted contract, great. You've got the deal going. You know your offer got submitted. If uh, you get a counter offer, you know the seller saw your offer because they, um, they counter offered. But uh, if it's rejected or the seller just lets it expire, you're going into highest and best multiple offers, uh, you also need to use this form as well. Um, the other, this is the most dangerous form in the library. This is uh, the SCR 390. Um, realtors think, oh my goodness, uh, SCR gave us this form with a bunch of blanks. I can just write whatever I feel like into these blanks. Wrong. That will get you possibly put into jail, uh, possibly sued, get your brokerage sued, uh, get you facing code of ethics violations under Article 13, unauthorized practice of law. Uh, facing license law violations, facing felony crime in South Carolina for the unauthorized practice of law. So in South Carolina, the practice of law, everybody knows that's in the courtroom, right? If you're in there defending a client or prosecuting a case or handling a civil matter, uh, that's probably the practice of law. But it's also outside the courtroom. So uh, South Carolina Supreme Court has said that the closing is the practice of law. That's why in South Carolina you see attorneys doing closings all the time. It's uh, illegal for non-attorneys to do real estate closings in South Carolina. And so there's a lot of court cases at the Supreme Court that said this is the unauthorized practice of law. And the document that controls this closing is the real estate contract. So it's not, it's never gotten to the Supreme Court, but our, uh, if it ever got to the Supreme Court, that filling out these forms, writing in legal language without a law license for something, if the closing is the practice of law and this document controls the closing, it's not a stretch to say the Supreme Court would say you'd be practicing law without a real estate, without a law license. 
which is felony crime. So this form SCR 390, it's got a lot of blank lines, but never write phrases, sentences, fragments of sentences into these blanks without an attorney looking at them. So check with your broker, check with your brokerage attorney, contact the hotline, talk to me, Byron King, or Austin Smallwood, or Tara Pitts in the near future when she's uh, trained to handle these issues. But this is the most dangerous form in the library, 390. Uh, be very careful, do not write into this form. Do not write, do not write sentences, do not write phrases, do not write sentence fragments, unless an attorney gives you those sentences or sentence fragments or phrases. It's the most dangerous form in the library. Be very careful about using this form. Byron, do you see the questions in the chat? I'll, I'll get those in a sec, thanks. Um, this is the uh, earnest money disclosure. So um, this is the one that uh, in the questions that uh, Tiffany sent, there was about 11 of them, this seemed to predominate most of them and we'll go through them more, but just be aware that this earnest money disclosure form is, um, kind of explains everything. So this is the earnest money disclosure form 620. You probably want to make sure that your sellers see this and your buyers see it. Um, it talks about uh, the parties understand that some of the transaction may fail to close for a variety of reasons. Uh, parties understand that the broker in charge earnest money has to handle that earnest money in accordance with real estate laws in his paraphrase below. And the buyers and sellers agree if a transaction fails to close, the broker in charge acting as an escrow agent is gonna hold the money basically indefinitely until uh, all the buyers and sellers sign a disbursement agreement stating who gets what amount of money or a judge um, in a court of competent jurisdiction has issued a disbursement order. Only when all parties sign the disbursement agreement or disbursement orders obtained from the court will the broker in charge properly disperse earnest money within a reasonable amount of time. So that being said, uh, if you're on this uh, Video, I'm gonna tell you how you never have to handle an earnest money dispute. And you never have to worry about handling earnest money. And that is use an attorney to hold the earnest money. Um, a lot of closing attorneys like to hold the earnest money as a way to get the closing business and make sure that they're using an escrow agreement. So kind of the background, uh, those that you've been around a while in Fort Mill, uh, probably remember when a deranged uh, buyer side individual went into a brokerage office with a nine millimeter pistol, pointed at all the agents because they were enraged about a thousand dollar earnest money dispute that was hung up in magistrate court. Uh, went in and shot the broker in charge in the abdomen with a pistol. Uh, thankfully the broker in charge survived. So at that point, our forms, we added things into the forms that would disperse the money. Basically every contingency said, if this contingency kicks in, the, you know, the parties agree the buyer gets their earnest money back. Uh, the Real Estate Commission didn't like that and said uh, the way they read license law, a broker can't do that. And we disagreed with them. And there was a uh, case at the Real Estate Commission that we, the realtor was found not in violation. We felt like that was the test case. And, you know, we had basically proven our point. The Real Estate Commission said, well, we don't agree. Um, we're just going to keep going after brokers in charge on this issue. And they, and they did. So at that point, our leadership took all that language out of the contract. However, attorneys don't work for the real estate commission. So attorneys can hold earnest money. Attorneys can disperse earnest money uh, as they see fit within, you know, within their guidelines. So my recommendation to avoid all earnest money dispute issues, have, uh, you, know, you know the closing attorneys you're probably gonna use anyway, go ahead and communicate with them now. Make sure they've got an escrow agreement. And the, you know, the cleanest escrow agreement basically says, you know, Byron King Law Firm's holding $1,000 of earnest money. Uh, if it, you know, for this deal and you, you know, identify the deal and if it closes, uh, the parties agree the money is a credit to the buyer at closing. And if it fails to close, uh, my recommendation would use something clean like parties agree uh, 30 days after a failed closing date in the contract, parties agree that Byron King Law Firm is going to disperse the earnest money to the buyer unless the seller's attorney sues the escrow agent over the earnest money. So attorneys holding earnest money is the number one way to avoid earnest money disputes. And based on your questions, there was a lot of earnest money questions. So use an attorney to hold uh, uh, earnest money. And that answers basically all the questions and we're gonna go through them, but use an attorney to hold earnest money is my recommendation uh, to avoid these issues. The other thing I wanna make you aware of, I still got your attention is this uh, wire fraud. So uh, in Lake Wiley area, a few years ago, we have a video on our YouTube channel and there's a lot of forms training videos at SC, SC Realtors on YouTube. 
And one of them was a, a buyer agent. She was walking out of a showing and her buyer called her and said, hey, I just wired a quarter of a million dollars per your email. And she's like, what are you talking about? I did not email you. And some hackers had gotten into her email and sent fake wiring instructions to her buyer client. And the buyer client wired $250,000 to the mafia. Um, fortunately, it was uh, a Wells Fargo to Wells Fargo bank transfer. Um, so they immediately called Wells Fargo and thankfully were able to stop the money. But had that money been going from uh, the buyer's bank account at Wells Fargo to any other bank in the world, there would be no way to have intercepted and that $250,000 would be gone. So you do not want uh, your buyers or your sellers losing hundreds of thousands of dollars to wire fraud. So you want to go through this form with your clients and your customers and say, look, there's a uh, organized crime across the globe. It's a multi-billion dollar criminal enterprise uh, for wire fraud. They target real estate. And so I'm never me, you know, I'm pretending to be you, the realtor, me, the realtor is never, 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 ever going to send you uh, wiring instructions via email. If you get any uh, wiring instructions through email, do not believe it. Do not wire the money. Contact me. Um, and you probably want to make sure you're using uh, closing attorneys uh, that you're familiar with. So you recognize the attorney's voice or you recognize the paralegal's voice. So at least you can get some sort of voice verification or maybe you pull them up on a Zoom call like this so you can see their faces and make sure you get the wire fraud, I mean, the wiring instructions, uh, so you don't fall into the trap of wire fraud. So never trust emailed uh, wiring instructions. All right, so we're getting into the contract now. So this is SCR 310. This is our main contract that uh, you probably have, are seeing. And so this is SCR 310, it's our contract's been around basically in this version since around 2017. Uh, we basically hired a law firm, Nexon Pruitt out of Columbia to help draft it. Uh, then took it around on a road show around the state for about a year and hundreds and of thousands of realtors had input on this. And it's uh, being tweaked even by the uh, uh, forms committee uh, every year to make it better based on suggestions from you, the realtors. So if you ever have a suggestion, you can always email me or Austin or Tier in the near future. So this is the uh, standard residential resale contract. Uh, and this is a cookie cutter form. It's designed for your average real residential transaction. Uh, a seller that's a residential seller lives there and selling their house. There's no tenant there. Uh, your regular buyer that's paying cash or needs to sell their house to get financing. Uh, useful for that. So if you're dealing with anything uh, outside of that kind of standard residential resale, if you're dealing with somebody that's flipping properties, if you're dealing with somebody that's got a tenant in the property, this form needs to be modified by an attorney in those cases. This is basically a very simple contract, cookie cutter contract designed for not new construction. Somebody's been living in the house and they're going to sell the house to an average buyer. So this is a very standard form so if you're dealing with some sort of flipper that's flipping the contract or signing the contract or there's a tenant in the property, uh, any, anything outside of that regular residential resale to a regular buyer, you know, make sure an attorney's modifying this contract. So uh, at the top, it basically says, hey, you know, everything in bold and all caps is kind of a warning. It's a legal risk management warning. And that's kind of our job to try to help keep you from getting sued, help you from facing ethics. Uh, facing license on that's kind of our way that helps you make money uh, because uh, the way you make money is you got income and then you minimize your cost and that's your profit right so we come in on that minimizing your loss part of it so helping you avoid fines helping you avoid lawsuits having to pay judgments having to pay attorneys uh, that's how we help make you more profitable through risk management so the first sentence parties are solely responsible for obtaining legal advice prior to signing this contract and during the transaction, real estate licensees recommend obtaining legal counsel. So this is a very formal document. Uh, it's a very important document. It's the most, for most people, it's the biggest investment in their lives. Um, so they need to be very careful with this document and treat it uh, as a legal document, as an important legal document. They need to read it and they need to know they need to have their attorney reviewing it prior to signing it. Now they can say, I, might, I don't want to have an attorney look at it. I'll just sign it. But your job is to make sure that they're warned to have their attorney look at it. If they sign it without doing that, 
something bad happens and they come back on you, you can say, not so fast, my friend. Uh, I did tell you to, to get legal counsel prior to signing and it's um, right there on the first sentence. So the section one's pretty easy, right? You just fill in the parties with their names, uh, buyer and seller. And you got some definitions, uh, the parties or the buyer or the seller. Uh, brokers are basically the South Carolina brokers in charge and all their associated licensees and their subagents. Um, closing attorney is the licensed South Carolina attorney selected by the buyer to coordinate the transaction and closing. You can even write down their name there if you want to. And so in some areas of South Carolina, one attorney generally does a typical residential closing. Sometimes you'll see the buyer has an attorney and the seller has an attorney. Um, and then effective date is basically uh, the date this contract uh, puts burdens on the buyer and the seller. And that's the final date upon which a party to negotiation places the final and required signatures and or initials and date on this contract and delivers notice to initially cause this primary contract to be binding on all parties. So the idea of this contract, uh, you've all heard that, you know, that Motown song signed, sealed, delivered. Uh, that's the idea of this contract. So to accept a contract, buyer sends an offer to a seller. The seller wants to accept it. They basically sign it and send a paper and electronic copy back to the buyer side and the buyer side has to know they've received it. So it's you know basically signed and delivered and received. And so that's how you create a contract uh, here. Good funds is the transferred acquired amount of United States dollars within any required time frame. So if somebody wants to use Bitcoin uh, to buy a house or they wanna use gold, uh, they would have to convert that United States dollars per this contract. Uh, time as stated will be South Carolina local time. Uh, time is of the essence with respect to all provisions of this contract, stipulating time deadline performance. That's uh, basically case law. Basically means all the deadlines mean what they say. And then the uh, next bolded section is kind of a license law requirements. If you are a buyer or a seller and you have a real estate license, you need to be checkboxing uh, if you are a buyer or a seller. And then the next section is where the parties, this is for license law, they have to initial and checkbox if they're getting client or customer service. Um, client on the buyer side, they're under a buyer agency agreement. Uh, client on the seller side, they've signed a listing agency agreement. They haven't signed anything or they're in transaction brokerage and they would checkbox customer service. So clients, uh, you, if you recall from your ethics, uh, you're the agent and they're the principal. So under agency law, you have to basically do what's in the best interest of your buyer client. You have to do what's in the best interest of your seller client. If they're a customer, your only duty is not to tell a lie to them. So um, clients, you're working in their best interest. Customers, you're just kind of a, an admin person pushing papers during the transaction. Section two is another easy section, purchase price. You're just putting in the numbers, you know, you know up in your area, uh, prices are getting big. So you, you're writing in there, uh, $600,000, you could write that in numbers and alpha numerics if you wanted to. And then you're checkboxing how it's being paid. Is it financing or a common, probably most common. Uh, a lot of folks are using a combination of finance and cash. Uh, or if you're lucky enough to have a cash buyer, uh, you're checkboxing that third box. Uh, verification of cash is available for closing is attached or not attached to be delivered before and you put a calendar date in there. So verification of cash, if somebody's paying cash, uh, you would send some reasonable documentation showing they've got that amount of money uh, that they can close and it's either gonna be attached to the contract or not attached or it's gonna be delivered before a date certain. And then the next box is this contract is or is not contingent upon the sale and closing the buyer's real property and SCR 504, which some of your questions were about, 504 is attached or not attached. So if they need to sell their house in New York before they can buy the house in Charlotte, or in this case in Fort Mill, I guess it's a South Carolina form, it'd be used south of the border uh, in Fort Mill, Rock Hill, in those environments, uh, this contract is or isn't contingent on selling their house in California and New York before moving uh, to South Carolina. Uh, number three, property. It's basically saying that uh, for a certain amount of money, the consideration uh, in this contract are the mutual promises. It's a bilateral agreement. The seller's gonna sell and the buyer's gonna buy. So mutual promises, seller's promising to sell and the buyer's promising to buy. And, and what are they buying? They're buying the dirt, and any of the, any interest in the dirt and any improvements, including the landscaping and systems and fixtures described below. So personal property is not conveyed by this contract. It's a real estate contract. So only things that are attached to the land 
uh, convey. And there's a blank below where you can put in personal property. And fixtures is a legal term from South Carolina case law, basically talking about how it's affixed to the property, how it's intended to be used in the property and what the party's intended. So fixtures, small word, but it basically means everything uh, that's attached to the land or the house. So that's why sellers can't take down light fixtures. They can't take the pull up wall-to-wall uh, -wall carpeting. They can't remove the doors. They can't remove the windows. Uh, they can't take all the sheetrock out of the house. They can't take all the plumbing out of the house. They can't take the HVAC system with them. So anything that's uh, attached would be a fixture uh, conveys. And so that little word conveys all that stuff. So it's an important word. And so the idea is with this contract, it's going to be in generally operable condition. It's a used house. So it's kind of like a used car. It's generally operating. And uh, so we'll go into that as we get further along. Landscaping or grounds, uh, you got to keep water in the grass in the summertime, that sort of stuff. Got to keep the heat on the winter so the pipes don't freeze. Uh, the buyer acknowledges opportunity to ask about owner's association, uh, common area issues, condominium master deed issues, any assigned parking or storage areas, you know, memberships like golf memberships, um, lease issues and financed equipment. That's talking primarily about solar panels. So if you see solar panels on the roof, uh, you know, red flags need to go off. Solar panels, we get a lot of calls on the hotline about solar panels. Uh, they're usually financed and finding out who owns the lien to those solar panels and finding out the payoff uh, can be difficult. If you haven't gone through that, that's an issue for you to be aware of. So if you're going up to look at a listing, see solar panels, make sure you call the uh, your broker in charge and your brokerage attorney in the hotline. Uh, and make sure you get your attorney, your closing attorney is aware of it and is working on finding out who owns the lien to those solar panels, what the payoff's going to be, who should get the payoff, who's going to send the satisfaction, all that jazz. And it brings up, uh, you know, uh, lease issues because if there's a tenant in there, again, lease Leases are not really considered part of this contract. Uh, but so if you see a tenant in there, you get when there's a tenant or there's a vacation rental on say a lake house on Lake Wiley. Uh, those are all red flags. You need to talk to your broker, your brokerage attorney, your closing attorney, the legal hotline to make sure those issues are being handled properly. Um, and then it also talks things like uh, solar panels, fuel tanks, uh, alarm systems. We've been getting a lot of calls about, uh, you know, ring doorbell systems, things like that. So what I would recommend is when you're filling out this bottom part of section three with the address, the city, zip code, county, lot, block, section, subdivision number, uh, there's two lines at the bottom and you can attach documents if you need more space. Anything that you want to convey and you don't want to get in a fight about, probably want to write in here. I mean, obviously inventorying an entire house would be, you know, 50 pages. You don't want to do that. But some things that are common that people dispute about uh, ring doorbell systems, you probably want to write that in. If there's something expensive, like a, you know, a fancy uh, refrigerator, you probably even want to, uh, when you're doing a viewing of the house, take a picture of the back of it with the serial number, make, model, and even write that into the contract. Other things we've heard over the years, you know, antique chandeliers in the dining room, uh, vanity mirrors in the bathroom. If they're fixtures, they convey, but the problem is if the seller says they're not fixtures and the buyer says they are fixtures, uh, everybody has to get a lawyer and they got to go to court to get a judge to listen to the evidence. And then the judge says if it's a fixture or not. So to avoid that, avoid uh, clients that are unhappy with you. Uh, maybe write some things in here, expensive items, you know, floating docks, uh, fountains, um, sheds, playground equipment. Uh, televisions that are mounted to the wall, speakers that are mounted to the wall, things like that. You probably want, those are things that uh, window treatments, you know, custom blinds and drapes. Instead of getting in a fight with somebody about it, write it in. And if it's in the MLS, the MLS is not part of this contract. So uh, don't rely on the MLS. If the MLS says the fridge conveys, don't rely on that. Do not attach the MLS sheet uh, to this contract because um, the square footage is in the MLS, right? And this contract, the way it defends you from a, a square footage lawsuit is a non-reliance clause further into the contract. That basically says if it's not in this contract, you can't be uh, uh, sued for misrepresentation. 
so the square footage, if it's not in this contract, uh, it helps shield you from a misrepresentation lawsuit. But if you attach the MLS sheet to get that fridge conveys into the contract, you've just put the square footage into the contract post closing buyer measures their house and feels like it's smaller than as advertised in their contract. So they were getting a 3,400 square foot house and they measure it and get uh, 3,200 square feet. And they decide to sue you for the value of 200 square feet plus their attorney's fees. Uh, you do not want that square footage uh, in the contract. If you attach the MLS data sheet, you just put the square footage into the contract. Uh, number four, conveyance and closing. So closing occurs when the seller conveys the property, the buyer includes no later than 5 p.m. on a date, you write that in. Uh, conveyance shall be free, fee simple, made subject to all easements, reservations, rights of ways, restrictive covenants of records, uh, provided they do not make the title unmarkable or adversely affect the property in a material way. Into all government statute ordinances, rules, permits, and regulations, seller agrees to convey markable title with a properly recorded general, general warranty deed, uh, free of encumbrances, liens, except here and stated in the names. So the buyer's names would go in here. Ownership is you know, determined by the buyer. The buyer would talk to their closing attorney, figure out if they want tenancy in common or joint tenancy. A uh, deed has to be delivered to the closing attorney's office on or before closing date, uh, no later than 10 a.m. So this is if you got two attorneys, you got a seller's attorney and a buyer's attorney. Seller provides the deed, uh, their attorney would deliver the deed to the buyer's attorney no later than 10 a.m. so they could get it closed and recorded by 5 p.m. that day. Seller's gonna pay all the deed recording fees. Uh, and there's some stuff to help you guys out here. Parties agree the brokers have access to the closing and documents. We'll get copies of the settlement statement prior to closing for review. Uh, parties agree to hire you to use attorneys. A uh, seller is going to convey, this is the part where the, there's no tenants, right? Because it says the seller is going to convey possession of a vacant and reasonably clean property free of debris, along with all keys, codes, and remote controls. So it's a vacant house being sold. Uh, you want to do a final walkthrough to make sure the house is basically working and everything looks good. Uh, the seller also has to provide all the keys and you know codes and remote controls. And if they got any documents like manuals or equipment warranties or service information on HVAC, refrigerators, things like that, televisions, they have to provide that, some more ownership items to the buyer closing. So earnest money, earnest money uh, is basically showing how earnest the buyer is because if there's no earnest money, the buyer might put out 15 contracts uh, and then just walk or terminate. So earnest money basically keeps buyers from doing that. So in this market where it's a hot market, buyers want, might want to use a large amount of earnest money and probably, as we talked about, use an attorney to hold it under an escrow agreement. So attorney holds the uh, earnest money under an escrow agreement. Realtors never touch the check. Check goes straight to the law firm. That way that'll protect you from getting dragged into an earnest money dispute. Uh, if the broker does hold the, uh, the money, then per that, this agreement and that uh, earnest money agreement, we you know, warning that we talked about earlier, Broker holds the money forever until the parties all sign a disbursement agreement uh, or a judge signs it. So six is transaction cost. Um, uh, we use the term transaction cost instead of closing cost because people argue about what is or is not a closing cost. So transaction cost is used here. And it basically says buyer's transaction cost include all cost, closing costs resulting from selective financing, prepaid recurring items, Insurance, uh, including but not limited to mortgage insurance, title insurance, lender owner insurance, flood insurance, and hazard insurance. Any discount points, interest, non-recurring closing costs, title exam, FHA, VA, allowable cost and fees and expenses of the buyer's attorney. Contractually required real estate brokerage compensation and cost of any inspector, appraiser, or survey. So basically kitchen sink, right? So the buyer's paying everything on their side. Um, and then the seller's paying everything on their side. It basically says the seller's transaction costs are deed prep, deed recording costs, deed stamps, taxes, recording costs, calculated and based on the value of the property, uh, all costs necessary to deliver marketable title and payoff, satisfactions of mortgages and liens and recording, uh, property taxes prorated at closing, uh, contractually required real estate broker compensation and fees and expenses. So, so the kitchen sink on seller side, their cost, kitchen sink on the buyer, it's their cost. And then you get into kind of how you can shift cost around. So um, all, the next paragraph, second paragraph talks about uh, owners associations and public and private transfer fees. 
and all costs similar to transfer fees, such as certificates of assessment, capital contributions, working capital, stopple fees, otherwise named but similar fees. Check box seller or buyer transaction cost, no box check. This would be in the seller's transaction cost. My recommendation to make this thing clean is you put it as a buyer transaction. And then the third paragraph, you state how much of the buyer side the seller is going to pay. That way you don't get an argument about who's paying that $25 for the certificate of assessment. Uh, everything's clean. So buyer's going to pay all their stuff. Seller's going to pay all their stuff. And in the third paragraph, uh, the seller says, hey, I'm going to pay this amount of money for the buyer's cost. You know, that's, if they put $3,000, they're paying $3,000. If they're putting 5,000, they're paying $5,000. And listing agents, what you want to tell your seller is, look, if you're trying to make this clean, pick an amount you're comfortable with and just let it go. Uh, recognize the buyer is going to use every penny. It's just human nature. If you say you're going to pay 2,000, the buyer is going to find $2,000 a cost. So seller, don't get an argument about 25 bucks. You know, you want to sell your house. Everything is on the buyer side. Everything's on the seller side. If you want to put zero here, you can put zero. Uh, but if you want to pay some for the buyer, you put an amount here and then you let it go. You don't worry about it. You don't lose sleep over it. You put a number, your seller, you put a number you're comfortable with. If that's zero, if that's a thousand dollars, if that's 2000, it's 10,000, whatever it is, seller, decide on a number and then let it go and don't quibble about, you know, 50 bucks here and there. Just uh, pick a number you're comfortable with and then just the buyer's going to use it all. And then section seven, finance. Uh, this is for the buyer that needs a, a loan to buy the house. And you can make this, uh, so this contract can off, operate like the North Carolina contract. Uh, we can uh, make it due diligence where due diligence covers everything. Um, and so the main difference between the North and South Carolina contract, there's three main areas uh, where our forms committee, and we saw North Carolina's contract, we love due diligence, but our forms committee said, hey, we want due diligence to be short you know, 10 to 15 days. So we need the ability to make finance run longer than that. We need the ability for the appraisal to run longer than that. And then we need the ability for the termite inspection to run longer than that. But if you want it to work like North Carolina, you use a long due diligence and you make this contract not contingent on financing, not contingent on appraisal and not contingent on the CL100 wood infestation report. And bingo, this thing operates just like the North Carolina contract uh, with due diligence. Other than the fact our due diligence in South Carolina is paid if you terminate. So if you never terminate, you never have to pay the due diligence termination fee, unlike North Carolina where you're paying that fee up front. But if you want a short due diligence period uh, and the buyer needs to get a loan, you're probably checking this contract's contingent on financing. Kind of describe the loan. There's some language in here that basically says the buyer is going to make a good faith effort to get the loan. They're going to give some documents from the lender that says they're on track to get the loan by a certain date. Um, but basically, this financing contingency runs to closing. So on the closing date, if the buyers had tried to get the loan and just for whatever reason uh, didn't get the loan, they could terminate uh, the contract even at, at the uh, closing table. If you don't like that, um, your option is to use due diligence and make this not contingent on financing. But you are going to have to use it like North Carolina with a longer due diligence period uh, to give the buyer time to get their financing. But it certainly can be done that way. All right, and then uh, Tiffany had said most of your questions were about this Section 8. So Section 8 uh, is basically repair procedure, due diligence, and as is. Um, as is, we talked about uh, that Form 390 being dangerous. As is is a very dangerous clause. So uh, you probably never want to check box as is unless you've talked to Tiffany and your brokerage attorney and the, you know, the buyer's attorney and the seller's attorney and maybe even the legal hotline. Because here's what as is, you know, buyers think as is means I can kick the tires and walk away if it's bad. Sellers think as is means the house burns down, you just bought a pile of ashes on a lot. So uh, because of those kind of visions that the buyers and sellers have in their head, try not to use as is unless uh, parties are adamant about it and you've checked with your broker and probably the attorneys as well. My recommendation based on the hotline uh, is to use due diligence and you're familiar with North Carolina. So for you guys, this makes your job a lot simpler if you're using due diligence, because um, then both contracts operate basically this, in the same manner. Uh, due diligence saws basically every hotline call I've ever gotten about this contract. If they were using due diligence, um, they wouldn't have to get lawyers and go to court about stuff. So due diligence, 
you have the advantage of being in North Carolina, so you understand the benefits of due diligence. Um, from legal side, due diligence is great. It's what the parties think they can do, right? The buyer thinks they can kick the tires and walk away. And the seller thinks if the buyer walks away, they should get some money for their time and effort, right? And that's what due diligence does. It basically says for a time period uh, from the effective date until 6 p.m. on a date, uh, buyer can kick the tires and can walk away if they want to. Uh, and if they walk away, uh, the sellers, you know, get the due diligence termination fee. So if the property is off the market for a couple of weeks, uh, maybe the seller wants, you know, $2,000 for that. They would get their 2000 So the seller's happy. They got some cash for their troubles. Buyer's happy because they got to kick the tires. And also due diligence enables you to negotiate everything. Uh, uh, you know, things that aren't in the repair procedure, uh, due diligence would enable you to maybe negotiate. One of the questions was, hey, there's a lot of repairs. Can we just settle for an amount of money? Seller's going to credit the buyer five grand in lieu of repairs. Due diligence allows you to do that. So if you like to do that, and your lawyer's giving that language to you about using cash in lieu of repairs, you need to be using due diligence. Due diligence solves almost all uh, disputes. So due diligence, I think it's the best thing since sliced bread. Um, and you guys are in North Carolina, you've seen North Carolina due diligence, how it works. So you're familiar with it. So this makes the contract work the same on both sides of the border. So a lot of advantages for due diligence. But a lot of the questions were on repair procedure. And keep in mind, repair procedure it means lawyer intensive if there's a dispute. So uh, lawyers love repair procedure because it means you're going to court uh, over everything, over uh, disputed repairs, if the buyer's in breach. Um, due diligence solves all of that. So my recommendation is A, don't ever use as is unless you talk to your broker and your lawyers uh, and try to use due diligence whenever possible. Try to avoid repair procedure. But here's kind of the idea of repair procedure because a lot of your questions were on repair procedure, so we'll go, go over it. Repair procedure basically means you're getting a basic working used house. Uh, it means things are basically going to be working like they're supposed to be working. They're not brand new. Uh, they might be 10 years old. They might be one year old. They might be 30 years old. They might be 50 years old. They might be 100 years old. They're kind of working. Um, and if you don't agree with how they're working, you got to hire a lawyer and experts and inspectors and engineers and, you know, go to court and argue about it. And for most buyers and sellers that are buying houses and selling houses to live in, the last thing they want to do is hire a lawyer uh, and go to court and argue about, you know, uh, is something an operative condition. But if parties are adamant about using repair procedure uh, and you've tried to talk them out of using uh, repair procedure and tried to talk them into using due diligence and they're hey, I'm ignoring your advice. I want to use repair procedure. Uh, here's how repair procedure works. So section eight, you would check box repair procedure. Uh, and then you need to tell the buyer, say, look, this doesn't enable you to do all the fancy stuff, due diligence. It doesn't allow you to use money in lieu of repairs. Um, it doesn't allow you to negotiate for certain things. It's basically just saying you're going to get a basic working house. And there's kind of nine categories of things that have to be working. So it basically says, uh, you know, first sentence under repair procedure, all repair procedure inspections and requests shall be completed and delivered to the seller by 6 p.m. on a date. So before that date, uh, you need to tell the buyer to get every inspection there is and let the buyer limit what they want to pay for. So you're recommending everything, air quality, structural engineer, home inspector, roof inspector, tree inspector, lawn inspector, plumbing inspector, electrical, you know, every kind of inspection under the sun. You say, buyer, you need to get those. You tell me what you want to pay for. And the buyer says, hey, uh, I'm going to save some money. I just want a home inspection. You say, okay, I've recommended you get all these others, but if you just want to get a home inspection, that's up to you. And so the home inspector goes in there. And so the home inspector says, you know, Heating systems working, air conditioning systems working, electrical systems are working, plumbing systems are working, water supply systems are working, wastewater systems are working. Um, there's no roof leak. Uh, there's no environmental concerns. The house looks structurally, improvements look structurally sound. That's it. Uh, you're buying the house. Um, so if those nine types of things are working, they're operative, uh, you're buying the house. Uh, and if the inspector says, um, 
well, there's a leaking, uh, you know, the sink's leaking. <laughs> there's a pipe under the sink that's leaking and it's rotted some wood under the sink. Uh, you know, you can put that in a repair request because that's, you know, the plumbing system's not operating, right? It's leaking. So what people usually want to argue about is structurally sound um, or operative condition. And that's all inspections, uh, experts and lawyers in court to figure that out if the parties disagree. So if the buyer just snoozes and doesn't do their inspections, uh, they're going to lose everything, you know, all their rights under this. And they're just getting the house. So the next paragraph says no later than, so once you deliver the repairs for that first sentence, you have your inspection and say the, the sink is leaking and the inspectors say the roof isn't leaking, but it's kind of worn out and you might want to replace the roof. So you put in your 525, your repair request, uh, fix the leaking sink in the kitchen and fix the leak near the chimney. Uh, and we want you to repair the whole roof, replace the whole roof. So the seller by 6 p.m. could say, um, I'll fix the sink and I'll fix the leak by the chimney, but I'm not fixing the worn roof. You're in a contract uh, because the roof is operative. Um, under due diligence, you could negotiate uh, for replacing the roof, but under repair procedure, if there's no leaks in the roof, the seller's done their job uh, with the roof, even if the roof only has a year left uh, on its lifespan. So one of the questions was, what if the seller, uh, so say the dates are, you know, 10 days from now, the buyer's got to get their inspection. So you start doing your inspections today. Uh, you deliver the repair request 10 days from now. And then say the seller has, you know, five days to get their estimates. And on day one, the seller's like, hey, it's a hot market. I'm, I'm not doing any repairs. I'm not fixing the leaky sink. Uh, I'm not fixing the leaky roof. I'm not replacing the worn roof. And they do that, say, on day one. So the, the seller has refused to make the repairs and the worn roof doesn't count, but the leaky sink and the leaky chimney roof, those two do count. Um, so the buyer would be on the clock for their two calendar days to terminate or this thing turns into an as-is contract. So once the seller says, no, I'm not going to fix something, and you'd probably, everything I'm talking about, you want in writing, right? You wanna make sure everything's in writing so nobody can change their story. Um, and it talks about delivered notice. And you notice that's capitalized. Notice is something in writing, either paper, or electronic, and delivered is sent to your email, uh, sent to your fax machine, or handed to you in person or US mail. It does not include text messages. Do not use text messages to negotiate these issues. Uh, only use emails or zip forms or fax machines or hand delivery. So the seller has a certain amount of time. If the seller says, I'll fix the nine basic things the seller says i'll fix the uh leaky roof and the sink but i'm not going to replace the worn out roof a buyer's in contract a buyer can't walk away they're in contract going to closing and so that's how repair procedure works um, the main thing is people argue about something if something's structurally sound or not that means you got to hire an engineer or an inspector or a contractor to come in the courtroom and the buyer's contractor engineer says it's not structurally sound. The seller hires an expert or an inspector or an engineer that says it is structurally sound. Lawyers present all the evidence to the judge and then the judge decides if that uh, was structurally sound or not. So repair procedure, lawyer intensive, try to avoid repair procedure uh, if you can. Try to use due diligence. You're used to due diligence in North Carolina. This contract can work just like your North Carolina contract. So I'd recommend that you Try to stick to due diligence if you can. And then the rest of the contract is basically kind of, uh, there's a couple of important things. Most of it's just kind of lawyer stuff. So section nine basically says uh, the buyer and their inspectors can inspect the property without destroying it. Uh, the seller's got to keep the property accessible, keep the utilities on. There's some risk management stuff about holding people harmless. Um, paying for damages and indemnifying the brokers. Um, here's the appraise, appraisal contingency. So this is an, a way that you can make the contract with a shorter due diligence. You can use financing contingency, appraisal contingency. So appraisal contingency basically says the property's got to appraise. If it appraises low, the buyer can lower the price to the appraised value within a time frame and keep the buyer in contract. If the seller says, I'm not gonna lower the price, uh, the buyer's got a time to 
either it's my dream house, I'm gonna buy it anyway, or I can terminate the contract. So we talked about financing appraisal. Here's the third one that you can make the uh, due diligence shorter by using the wood infestation report. Cause in South Carolina, the termite inspection has got to be within 30 days of closing. And this acts as, as a kind of a miniature repair procedure. Um, the wood infestation pest inspector crawls under the house, looks around if they find termites uh, or you know, presence of damages of termites, the seller has got to repair it uh, and then basically you know, deliver documentation that it's been uh, treated for any, any pests and any damage has been repaired. And the rest is kind of boilerplate. So you got your survey, basically you're saying, hey, buyer, I recommend you get the property surveyed, the title examined, check for a flood zone, you know, in your area, creeks, lakes, things like that might flood. Um, make sure you get insurance, flood, flood contents, hazard, owner's title, effective at closing. Um, survival, you need, if they need to prorate the property taxes, they can settle up after closing. That's primarily what 13 is for. 14 is where the seller can pay for some of the uh, home warranty. If the buyer wants to get a home warranty or the seller could say you're paying it for it yourself. 15 is what happens if there's some sort of a fire, lightning strikes the house. If there's some sort of casualty to the house for five days, either party can terminate um, or they could buy it. The buyer could say, hey, it's my dream house. I still want to buy it. And if that's so, then the seller is going to fix the property or give some cash to the buyers or give the buyers the right to the insurance and, you know, pay for the deductible. But if the buyer calls the damage of their inspectors damage the house, you know, the buyer's on the hook for all that. 16 is important. Always try to get the property disclosure statement into the contract, even if they're exempt. If you're listing a property, try to force the seller to fill out a property condition disclosure statement. Uh, because this basically, we've got case law all the way to the South Carolina Court of Appeals. It says if there's a seller disclosure, the realtors can't be sued unless they knew there was false answers in there. So this is one of your best liability protections. So always try to get a property disclosure. Uh, lead-based paint basically goes through, you know, if it's built prior to 78, you're going to have some lead, EPA lead documents uh, that you've got to hand to the parties and get them to sign documents. 18, sex offender or criminal information. It's basically saying, hey, brokers aren't out there patrolling for sex offender registry. Realtors should not go on the sex offender registry and read about it because you have, then you have actual knowledge of where the sex offenders are and you might have a duty to disclose. You need to tell Buyers, hey, you need to do your own work, hire a private investigator, do it yourself online. Look at the sex offender registry, look at the uh, meth lab registry, uh, check with law enforcement about any kind of criminal issues that are important to you. Uh, so realtors do not go online researching sex offenders where they are. Uh, do not go online looking at meth lab addresses because you have actual knowledge Then everybody in your brokerage has a duty to disclose those uh, to buyers. Uh, trust account, you know, we talked about the brokers trying to get the attorney to hold it. So hopefully you don't even have to deal with 19. You're using attorneys to hold the earnest money. 20, uh, if somebody's uh, selling a house and they're not paying South Carolina income taxes or U.S. income taxes and they make a gain on their house, uh, this is putting them on alert that they need to pay those taxes. South Carolina, the closing attorney is going to do withholdings and they would have to file a South Carolina income tax return to try to get some of that money back. A lot of this is lawyer stuff. 21 is kind of a lawyer thing, basically says everything is in the four corners of all these pages, not outside of this contract. Basically part of your square footage defense. Adjustments talking about how you're going to uh, settle or prorate things like utility and waste fees, um, real estate taxes, HOA fees. Um, rents, deposits, fees associated with leasing, like for roll carts or alarm systems uh, or solar panels, uh, insurance. In some counties, there's EMS service fees. There's a fuel tank prorating the fuel. Um, closing attorney is going to do their best uh, to prorate the taxes if the tax bill is not out yet. And this basically says that the taxes <coughs> uh, are inaccurate when the tax bill comes out. The parties agree to settle up. This is mainly to keep you out of the line of fire. Instead of them yelling at you about, uh, why didn't you protect me about property tax? You say, actually, you are. You can uh, go to court and get that thing reprorated. 
22 is lawyer stuff. If somebody breaches the contract, uh, the other side can terminate. Um, but one of the questions in your 11 was, how do you terminate a contract? The only time you should feel comfortable terminating a contract, the only time, the only time is on your due diligence. So if the buyer is terminating within due diligence, they're sending the notice of termination, uh, 313 plus the termination fee. That's the only time you should be comfortable uh, without a lawyer. Any other time somebody wants to get out of a contract, seller wants to end the contract, they say the buyer's in breach, buyer wants to get out for whatever reason, uh, you need to tell them you need to talk to an attorney and you need to document that with an email. Hey, I know you want to get out of the contract. You think the other side's in breach. Uh, Realtor ethics require me to recommend you get legal counsel. So the only time you should feel comfortable terminating without talking to Tiffany or me uh, or the buyer's attorney or the seller's attorney is due diligence with a 313 in the check for due diligence termination fee. Any other time, repair procedure, finance contingency, appraisal contingency, lightning strikes the house. Anytime somebody wants to terminate other than due diligence, you need to talk to your broker in charge, your brokerage attorney, legal hotline. Uh, never feel comfortable about a party terminating this contract except for a buyer under due diligence. Every other time you need to be talking to your broker, probably even under due diligence, you want to give Tiffany a call. Um, but uh, the only time you should be, feel comfortable about a buyer terminating this contract is timely and properly under due diligence. Every other time should make you very, very nervous about getting sued, your client getting sued, uh, you facing ethics charges, you facing license law charges, you facing felony unauthorized practice of law charges. Never feel comfortable about termination without a lawyer involved and your broker involved unless it's due diligence. 24 is mediation. We'll talk about that a little bit later. That's basically the parties are trying to settle. Uh, it's a way to try to not go to court. Um, so mediation is settlement. We currently provide free Zoom uh, settlement services to our mediators that have volunteered to do that. 25 is that non-reliance clause that works with the merger uh, section above. This is your square footage defense. It basically says if square footage is not in this contract, they can't sue you about it. Um, if you staple the MLS sheet or you write in the MLS uh, number into this contract, you just arguably put square footage into this contract and that defense, it goes away. Broker disclaimer. So realize your license, your license to help market real estate. That's all you're licensed to do. Um, you're not an inspector. You don't inspect for termites, radon, mold, asbestos, moisture, environmental issues, or water waste, air quality, HVAC, utilities, plumbing, electrical structure, condition of the property, survey or legal issues, that's the surveyor and lawyer's job, square footage, that's the appraiser's job or the buyer if they want to get their tape measure out, off-site conditions, that's the private investigator's job or the buyer's job, schools, that's the buyer's job or if they want to hire some sort of school expert to research the schools, um, title, that's the lawyer's job, zoning and restrictions on the property. That's the lawyer's job. Uh, you're not making any guarantee that this house is going to be worth more in the future. You know, it's going up now, but uh, in the future, we don't know what the economy is going to do. It might keep going up. It might stay the same, might go down. You're not making any guarantees what taxes are going to do, except they're probably going to go up. Uh, insurance, you're not making any guarantees. The only thing you're licensed to do is market real estate, only market real estate. Everybody else has a job other than that. So do not take on these other jobs that will get you sued, your brokerage sued, facing ethics violations, facing license law violations. 27, this is the most important part of the contract for you. It basically says the closing attorney is gonna pay your brokerage um, during the closing. And if there's a dispute, the lawyer's going to escrow the money and the parties can go get a judge to award the money or you're getting the money within 180 days if they don't have a court order on that money. 28's attachments. We're going to talk about a lot of these attachments. You can write them in. Uh, the common attachments are listed there. 390 is the most dangerous form in the library. That's the blank form. Don't be writing sentences or phrases into that. Uh, 391, we'll talk about. That's a very useful form. Uh, 503 is the bill of sale. That's good for personal property like the swing set. 504, um, we're going to talk about that. That's when they need to sell their house in New York. 315, 320, 393, 370, 375, 513, 610. Those are all important forms that can be attached here. Or if the lawyer's drafted something, if your lawyer, your brokerage has certain forms, you could write them in here. 
Notice and delivery, we talked about this earlier. So this contract is basically a signed, sealed, delivered. Everything's got to be in writing. So notice is kind of a fancy word for a paper electronic writing. It's got to be delivered to the other side to the address or email address uh, or fax number written into the contract. Notice it does not say text number. So do not use text to be negotiating these contracts. Use your talk on the phone, text informally, but always follow up with an email or a fax or hand delivering some sort of document, either uh, paper or electronic. And then kind of wrapping up the end part, it basically um, reiterates, hey, wiring, there's cro crooks out there trying to steal your wire. So don't uh, wire money without verifying that it's accurate. Um, and then another warning, um, these houses, these listings, there's cameras and microphones in these houses. Sellers are watching you and listening. Um, some of these cameras and microphones are so small, you'll never know they're there. If you're on the listing side, uh, the listing agreement basically goes over surveillance, basically says, hey, sellers, uh, you need to check with your attorney, make sure you comply with the laws. Don't put cameras in the bathrooms or anywhere somebody might have expectations of privacy. Um, but if you're in a listing, uh, you need to train your buyers not to talk um, in listings. Don't make derogatory comments about the property. Don't walk in and say, this is my dream house. I'd pay, pay full price because somebody might be listening and that will help them in negotiations. If you need to communicate while you're inside a listing, you know, use a notepad or text each other. Uh, tell your buyers, hey, just don't say anything out loud. Somebody might be listening to us till we get off site someplace secure where we can talk securely because these surveillance systems are out there. They are being used. Um, basically it says that uh, you got copies of this contract, the disclosure real estate brokerage relationships, your agency agreements. Basically that's kind of a protect you from somebody saying, I never got a copy of that. You say, well, you signed it. Uh, and it says that you did. It basically says they had time to review this and get their lawyer again. So if something goes wrong, and they say, hey, you never told me I should talk to a lawyer. Say, actually, I did. Here's where you sign the page where it says it. And you can make the offer expire uh, by a certain deadline. And then the buyer sign it, date and time it. You can write in your notice, address, and email. It's probably going to be the buyer agent's address, the buyer agent's email, the buyer agent's fax. Seller is going to do the same. And then the information page, you'd fill out your name and your company, your, uh, your office code your email, your telephone number, and then the list side is going to do the same thing. All right, so that's the uh, contract. We'll look at the questions real quick to take on a city here. All right, so I'm in the chat box. Uh, let's see. What if the seller does not have the offer presented before the expiration? So if you think back, real estate school, um, if a if an offer expires, it's dead, right? So, I mean, you can see it, but if you send anything back, uh, you can't accept it because it's dead. Uh, so anything you send back to the buyer is basically a fresh offer from the seller to the buyer. So if it expires, uh, it's basically dead and you can revive it, but you cannot accept it. Um, if the offer is expired, why would you have to use the offer rejection form? So um, short answer, because the law says you have to. Um, keep in mind what the purpose is. If you haven't been there, you're going to be there where you're the buyer agent, you present an offer, you never hear anything, and you say, oh my gosh, I wonder if that thing even got presented to the seller. So if it expires, you want to make sure that the offer got presented. Uh, so the law says you got to present the offer rejection form. Because um, if you don't, what's going to happen? They're going to file a license law complaint against you and your broker in charge, and you're not going to have a defense because you didn't send it. The law says you're going to send it. So you're going to be found in violation of license law that's going to be posted on the Real Estate Commission's website forever. So if anybody Googles your name or your brokerage name, uh, you and your broker in charge are going to show up on the Real Estate Commission's website as being a violator of license law. So if somebody's thinking about using you for a buyer agent or listing their house and they Google you and find out you're in, you've been found in violation of license law, they might not use you. They might not use your brokerage. So that's why. Uh, what does TMS mean on 390? So we'll um, tax, map, tax map number. Uh, next question, if earnest money is held by an attorney and said the broker in charge of the same rules applies outlined on the earnest money disclosure? Uh, no. So the attorneys don't, aren't under, the attorneys are regulated by the South Carolina Supreme Court. So the real estate commission has said broker in charges 
hey, we're the real estate commission. We regulate the broker in charge. We want the broker in charge to hold the money forever until the parties sign a piece of paper or a judge signs a piece of paper. Now, the parties can go into mediation and get a mediation agreement. That's a piece of paper. Parties can sign the release. Um, that also disperse. That's a piece of paper. A uh, broker can file a magistrate interpleader against the buyer and seller and get a judge's order. That's a judge's piece of paper. So, but lawyers aren't under the real estate commission. So my recommendation would be to always, always, always uh, buyer sends the earnest money straight to the lawyer's office. Lawyer drafts an escrow agreement that the lawyer signs, the buyer signs, the seller signs. It basically says buyer and King law firms are holding a thousand dollars for 123 Main Street for buyers, you know, John Smith and Jane Smith. Uh, and sellers, you know, Bob Jones, um, if it's closing, if it closes by this date, uh, you know, April 1st, 2021, you know, the parties agree it'd be a credit to the buyer. If it fails to close on April 1st, parties agree, Byron King Law Firm will disperse the money to the buyer uh, 30 days after that failed closing date, unless the uh, seller brings a lawsuit against the escrow agent. That way everybody's protected. The buyer gets their money back without having to go to court. Broker doesn't have to hold the money forever. The broker doesn't have to sue their buyer and, and the seller. The seller's protected because the seller can hire an attorney and sue and, and get that money. And of course, if the seller sleeps on that, then, you know, instead of everybody having to uh, be held up indefinitely because the seller's just sleeping on their interest, uh, it takes care of that. If you own or have an interest in a corporation or LLC that is a party of the contract and you're an agent, yes, I would recommend if. Uh, um, you know, if you have an investment company, a corporation, or an LLC that you check um, that, uh, and you can explain that. You can check yes, and then, you know, in a blanks or attach a form that says, hey, uh, you know, I'm Byron King, I'm a, the buyer's agent, uh, and I'm not the buyer's agent, but I, I'm the, uh, the LLC that's buying the buyer, you know, say it's investment LLC is the name of the buyer. You'd say investment LLC is an LLC owned by me. I have a real estate license. Uh, it's owned by me and my spouse. It's owned by me and some investors, that sort of thing. You would disclose that. Um, would there be a reason to check? No, SCR 504 is being attached if you mark uh, is contingent. I recommend you always use 504 because it, it takes care of the main, and we're gonna get the 504. It takes care of the main reason, but um, yeah, if you're not using 504, I would always use 504 because it, it handles what happens in a subsequent buyer, but. Uh, that's the intent of the forms is to use 504. Uh, fixtures, uh, stove included and fridge. So fixtures, the test is how is it uh, attached to the property? How is it intended to be used? What, what did the parties intend? <clears throat> so the most common, you know, in a kitchen, you might have a built-in stove, built-in fridge. Maybe uh, there's gas lines hooked to the stove. It's a gas stove. Maybe the fridge has water lines attached to it. Uh, for ice or cold water coming out of the front of the fridge. Uh, it's in the kitchen. You know, most people like to cook in the kitchen using the stove. They store food in the fridge. Those are probably going to be fixtures. I would still write down the uh, make and model number, especially the expensive ones, just to keep the seller from trying to be sneaky and, and swap something out for a cheaper version of it. Um, what I'm talking about uh, might not be fixtures. Say there's a a 30 year old fridge sitting out in the garage and it's just plugged into the uh, power outlet out there. Because a table lamp's not a fixture, right? A table lamp just sits on a table, you plug it in, you turn it on, you can read books while using the light. That 30 year old fridge sitting out in the garage uh, might not be a fixture. It's kind of sitting out there. It's not really intended to be used for cooking. It's maybe it's out there to keep some beers cold. Uh, it plugs into the wall. There's no attachments. It's not built in. That might not be a fixture. So you might want to add that to the contract just to keep people from arguing about it. Next one, if earnest money is not delivered, what is the best practice to terminate the contract and make the home active again at MLS and accept a backup offer? So this is asked from the listing side. So you're the seller. You find out the buyer never delivered the money. That's another good reason to use the attorney and, he, and the attorney's escrow agreement because the seller would sign a, a document that says Byron King's holding $1,000 and Byron King signed it. That's pretty good indication that the money got delivered. Uh, if you don't get an escrow agreement or I say, I'm not signing that, I never got the $1,000, you know right away uh, that the buyer failed to deliver earnest money. So from the listing side, um, Remember, the only, only time you should be comfortable terminating a contract without a lawyer is under due diligence if the buyer is terminating under due diligence. 
So the seller terminating the contract is not the buyer terminating her due diligence. So you'd be nervous. So you need to document, you need to tell the seller, hey, um, you know, the buyer didn't deliver the money. You want to terminate under the NER code of ethics. I have an ethical duty to recommend you talk to your attorney. The seller can ignore you and say, hey, I'm sure they're in breach. I don't need an attorney. Terminate this contract and put the home active in MLS again. So you would say, yes, sir, or yes, ma'am. And then you would send an email, dear seller, um, March 10th, uh, we had the conversation about me recommending uh, you talk to your attorney. You decided not to. You directed me to send a 313 notice of termination on the buyer side and make the home active in MLS again. Um, and I'm following your orders after uh, I recommended you talk to an attorney first. Then the second part of that question is about accepting a backup offer. Uh, what I would do with backup offers until you get the release signed by the buyer and the seller, um, maybe get an attorney to draft something that basically says, you know, this contract's contingent on that first contract uh, not being enforceable and no lawsuits other than earnest money disputes going on. That way you've got, the seller's got a way to get out of that subsequent offer. If a worst case scenario, the buyer says, well, actually I did deliver the earnest money. I'm not in breach. Now seller, you're in breach because you terminated. I'm gonna sue you and I'm on, my attorney's gonna sue you and my attorney's gonna put a list pendants on the property. That's gonna mess up buyer two's lending and now buyer two is going to sue you as well. So I would always have an attorney draft something in there about uh, contingency to allow the seller to get out of this uh, su subsequent offer. Uh, next question, handling payment of due diligence fees should be separate from the earnest money. So due diligence, the only time you should be comfortable terminating this contract if the sellers, I mean, the buyer is timely and properly terminating with a 313 notice of termination in the check for due diligence fee. My recommendation would be to keep it clean. Buyer, you get your due diligence fee in. We've got an escrow agreement with Buyer and King Law Firm that says you're getting the earnest money back in 30 days unless the seller sues about it. Um, so my recommendation would be uh, buyer comes up with due diligence fee, pay that, and then worry about the earnest money later. Problem with trying to get out of earnest money, how are you going to get the money out of the lawyer's account? Say it's, uh, say your due diligence is, you know, deadline is today at 6 p.m. Uh, can you get a hold of the lawyer? Will the lawyer give you the money? Uh, can you get the money from the lawyer and get it over to the other side before 6 p.m. when your due diligence expires? Um, if the broker's holding it, uh, say whoever's got to sign the check that day is out. They got, you know, they had to go to the hospital getting a vaccine, what have you, the kid's sick, whatever. Uh, you can't get the check signed. Uh, can you get that money by 6 p.m.? I would just say keep it clean. Buyer pay the due diligence termination fee and worry about the earnest money later. But if your brokerage wants to try to do that, remember the brokerage has to get a piece of paper signed by the seller saying give uh, earnest money back to the buyer. Uh, sellers might not be cooperative about that. So my suggestion Buyer pays the due diligence fee and worries about earnest money after that. Biggest issue we come across with due diligence is that uh, tender in South Carolina just do not want to use this and they advise their sellers not to accept a due diligence contract. How can we get all this? So you're preaching in the choir. You know, I told you my preference is to use due diligence. So uh, we went to due diligence. Uh, we saw it in North Carolina in 2010. We started trying to get people to use it in 2012. Um, your market, you're probably going to have more acceptance than the rest of the state. People don't like to change. Um, uh, so you kind of have to be a kind of a, a salesman. You kind of have to sell due di a salesperson. You got to sell due diligence uh, to these listing agents. You know, you probably want to go on the phone and say, hey, um, we're going to submit a due diligence offer. You know, this is good for your seller, right? Because the seller knows within this window uh, this buyer is either going to buy the house or not buy the house, and the seller is getting some cash in their pockets. And these, you know, these buyers want to buy this house, so it's unlikely they're going to walk. Uh, but if they do walk, the seller is going to get some cash. Um, if you use a repair procedure, buyers think they can walk anyway, and most sellers aren't going to sue anybody. Uh, buyers know that, so there's a lot of good reasons for sellers to use due diligence, like this question uh, kind of mentions. Kind of a street urban myth that due diligence is buyer friendly. I, I would argue with that, that the seller gets some cash, the seller gets a lukewarm buyer out of the way quickly, uh, but you might have to sell it. And that's what we've been trying to, you know, you notice how much I talked about how much I like due diligence. I go around the state and say that all the time, but trying to uh, get buyers to um, uh, get listing agents to, to realize that that's kind of our challenge. Rock Hill, Fort Hill, Fort Mill market, you're lucky because they're used to the North Carolina contract and they know 
uh, due diligence can work. Our problem is Myrtle Beach, they felt like all the snowbirds would never buy a house again under uh, due diligence. We're like, look, you know, North Carolina's got a coast. They've got, you know, Wrightsville Beach. Uh, they've got uh, Kitty Hawk, uh, Outer Banks. They use due diligence and they still sell houses at the beach. But uh, that's kind of the resistance we face. Charleston ran, Charleston liked due diligence and has run some statistics and the fallout on due diligence and repair procedures, roughly the same. So it doesn't mean that contracts are gonna fall out. Um, and tell them repair procedures, lawyer intensive. If there's a dispute in repair procedure, you're not gonna be able to cleanly sell this house to another buyer. Uh, there might be lawyers involved and experts involved. Due diligence eliminates all that. It's very clean and the sellers get some cash within a time window. Uh, and the next one kind of as a follow-up to that, are there any discussions to remove the repair procedure options from the contract? Yeah, our forms committee has made that recommendation probably every year for about the last 12 years. Uh, and there's just some resistance. I mean, there's pros and cons to everything, uh, but there's some people that like repair procedures. So for the foreseeable future, uh, we've got those options in there. It took us from 2012 to 2017 to even get due diligence into the body of the contract. It wasn't an addendum, so we're making progress. But we need you guys out there trying to explain to uh, South Carolina list agents why due diligence is good for everybody. Let's see, it really will. Almost all offers I received on my most recent South Carolina listing were labeled. Yeah, you're gonna have to kind of sell it a little bit. Um, you know, when you're at meetings, uh, kind of talk up due diligence, tell them how great it works in North Carolina. Um, but I mean, it is what it is. Is two calendar days and repair procedures start from the notice of the seller actual date on the contract? So we talked about that. If the seller says, I'm not going to fix the roof, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to replace the worn roof. Uh, I'm not going to fix the leak by the chimney. Uh, under repair procedure, the seller could refuse to replace the worn roof. But once they say, I'm not fixing the leak near the chimney in the roof, that's one of those nine basic and the buyer's on the clock uh, to terminate. So whenever the seller gives you a piece of paper or an email that says, I'm not fixing one of those nine categories, the buyer's on the clock. And remember, the only time you're comfortable with a buyer terminating is under due diligence during the due diligence period. So repair procedure is not due diligence. So if you got a buyer wanting to terminate under repair procedure, you need to so you need to talk to a lawyer. Um, it is sufficiently unclear about what happens to earnest money if the seller refuses to repair under repair procedure and buyer terminates. I believe earnest money should be returned to the buyer, but wording is not there. So this is the thing we talked about um, back in 2010, the broker in Fort Mill was gun shot. We had language in there that basically said if the buyer properly turned in a repair procedure, the broker could turn the money back to the uh, buyer. Real estate commission said, no, you can't do that. We don't read license law the same way. We did the test case. We thought it was the test case. We won the test case, took about a year and about $8,000. And then the real estate commissioners came to our conference in Greenville to our forms committee and said, well, we're not following that precedent. We're just going to keep going after brokers on this issue. So we took the language out. But lawyers are not under the real estate commission. So lawyers can put in their escrow agreement. If buyer terminates under repair procedure timely and properly, I'm going to disperse the money to the buyer. Uh, so lawyers could actually do that, but brokers cannot. Brokers are prohibited by the real estate commission from doing that. Uh, under appraisal contingency, there's nothing about the earnest money disbursement. So again, it used to, broker in Fort Mill got shot about earnest money disbursement in a financing contingency. We put the language into the contract, uh, it worked fine for a number of years. And then in 2017, the Real Estate Commission uh, said, you can't do that. We won the test case, but the Real Estate Commission went after some other brokers, so we took the language out. So uh, lawyers are not under the Real Estate Commission. So under an escrow agreement, lawyer could say, hey, under the appraisal contingency, the buyer terminates, they get the earnest money back. Uh, similar to Tiffany's question, the North Carolina contract, if the contract terminates for any reason, there are procedures to determine who is entitled to earnest money. Is there anything in the SCR contract to do that factors it up for a debate? So uh, Real Estate Commission says the contract can't disperse earnest money. We disagreed with them. We won the test case, what we thought was test case. Real Estate Commission said, we're not following our own precedent. We're going to keep going after brokers. So we took the language out. Lawyers are not under the Real Estate Commission. So the lawyer's escrow agreement could disperse, could state exactly how you're dispersing earnest money um, for re repair procedure, appraisal procedure, wood infestation, financing, and the fail safe. 30 days after a failed closing, the money goes to the buyer unless the seller sues me.
Since the due diligence is delivered at the end of due diligence, the buyer chooses to walk away as the due diligence fee be taken from the earnest money the buyer's reluctant. No, don't, don't get involved with the earnest money. There's a lot of uh, paperwork that has to be done with earnest money. Uh, just tell the buyer, hey, let's keep it clean. Let's not get lawyers involved. Pay the due diligence fee. And then your uh, escrow agreement says you're going to get your earnest money back because Byron King Law Firm put that in there. If you terminate under due diligence, you get your earnest money back. If you use contracts contingent upon appraisal, can both the buyer and the seller negotiate the price after the appraisal? So the way the appraisal contingency works, uh, appraisal comes in at price or higher, good to go. So if the appraisal comes in low, uh, the seller can drop the price to the value and keep the buyer in contract, but the seller's market right. So a lot of sellers are gonna say, heck no, I'm not lowering the price. And then the buyer's gotta make a decision. Is the buyer walking or is the buyer gonna come up with the cash to close anyway? If the, buyer, if the seller disagrees with the buyer's repair request, then the buyer can walk away when using the contingency on repair. So the only time, the only time you should be comfortable about a buyer walking away from the contract is if you use due diligence and you're delivering 313 notice of termination and the due diligence fee to the other side within the due diligence period before 6 p.m. on the deadline. Any other time, repair procedure, appraisal contingency finance, anything else, it's lawyer time. Uh, let's see, buyer and I see a lot of other agents when they want to terminate a contract and ask they only send a lease form and not the termination form. I always instruction my agents ask they send 313 at least not terminate. So uh, best practice would be uh, they're sending over the 313 and the 518. 313 is the notice of termination, 518 is the release. Uh, but we got what, 30,000, I mean, 25 to 30,000 uh, realtors. Uh, North Carolina is like double that. Um, and then you got people that aren't realtors. And you got people right out of school. You got brokers that aren't really supervising, team leaders that might not be supervising. You can get all kinds of crazy stuff. The best practice is 313518. But anything in writing that says I'm not buying the house uh, technically could be considered notice. It's a writing, it's paper, electronic, it was delivered. Um, but for you guys, uh, always send 313 and a 518. Form 390, the most common use of this form is change of the closing date. A lot of lenders want us to have the exact closing date on the contracts, except for That's a good question. That's an excellent question. So what I hear, what I recommend is when you're changing closing date, you're changing price, you're changing anything in the contract, lift that sentence right out of SCR 310. So let me share my screen, I'll show 310. So if you're going to change closing date, um, what I would do is just copy this whole sentence here. So um, you would start here, closing occurs when seller conveys property, buyer and clear is no later than 5 p.m. on or before closing date period. Lift that whole sentence. It's lawyer drafted. Uh, SCR attorneys have approved that sentence. You can just pluck that sentence and put it on 310 right there. Uh, same with price. You could just uh, purchase price, lift that whole section. Basically anything you're going to change on three, three, 390 is the blank form. Just lift it straight out of the whole sentence or the whole paragraph right out of 310 in, in there and use that. So, closing down original contract, all paying the state. Would South Carolina ever consider doing an amendment to the contract like North Carolina has update dates, earnest money, and due diligence? Uh, I'm not, I've looked at a lot of North Carolina forms, not 100%, uh, you know, we'd have, you know, if you see a form in North Carolina that you love, send it to us while the forms committee look at it. If due diligence, the house doesn't appraise and the seller won't reduce the price, is the termination fee still due under the, that's a good question. So, so you've got uh, due diligence period running and during your due diligence, the appraisal gets done. So remember due diligence and an appraisal contingency allows that appraisal to fall later. So you could have a shorter due diligence, but say they overlap. So it overlaps and you're under due diligence and the appraisal comes in low. So your buyer says, hey, seller, will you reduce the price to the appraisal value? And the seller says, no, this is a hot market. I'm not, I'm not reducing the price. Uh, the buyer could terminate under the appraisal contingency, which does not trigger the uh, due diligence termination fee. But keep in mind, uh, the way the South Carolina form is designed to work, is the appraisal would come after the due diligence period. So unlike North Carolina, where you have a long due diligence period, um, 
Uh, South Carolina is designed for that classic 10, 15 day due diligence. And a lot of times you would want to inspect the house. Here's the reasoning from the forms committee. They said, we want to inspect the house. And if the house meets our inspections, then we'll pay the $400 for the appraisal. So the intent of the forms committee was the appraisal could come after due, but it doesn't have to, right? You could have a long due diligence period and the appraisal period the contingency overlaps uh, due diligence. You terminate on your appraisal contingency, you don't pay for that. It's a free termination because the seller had the chance to reduce the price and chose not to. Uh, listing agents are collecting offers and not responding for a period of days. Please discuss this practice when it's in violation and offers respond to in a timely manner. So that's an excellent question. Uh, it would depend on the facts. Um, so say you're the listing agent and you get an offer, but your seller is, um, you know, they're, uh, they're service members, they're deployed to Afghanistan. They're out in a, some sort of forward operating base in Afghanistan. And it might take you a long time to get in touch with them. Uh, so it might be a longer time period. On the other hand, uh, they might live uh, in South Park and you could basically drive over to their house and give them the document, you know, and then within the hour. Um, then, you know, waiting a few days might not be timely. So, but the Real Estate Commission makes that decision. What I would say is if you feel like you're getting uh, abused, if the listing agent is abusing this practice, uh, talk to your broker in charge, call the hotline, maybe talk to the other agent first I mean, pick up the phone and talk to the list agent. If they say, you know, they're not helpful, talk to your broker, maybe the broker's in charge, talk. And, but at the end of the day, if you don't, if you feel like they were gaming the system, uh, you'd file a written license law complaint against the licensee and their broker. A uh, real estate commission would send an investigator. Uh, they might say, hey, my seller was in forward operating base Afghanistan. It took me a week to get in touch with them. Real estate commission might say, well, that makes sense. Uh, we're not going to find a violation. Or the real estate commission says, hey, look, this, this buyer lived in, I mean, correction, the seller lived in Ballantyne uh, and they would come to your office all the time. Uh, that, wasn't, that wasn't reasonable for you to sit on the offer that long. So we're going to find you in violation. So facts matter. Lawyers in our area do not have escrow agreements. Uh, they need to get one. Uh, these are lawyers that have never been through an uh, earnest money or any kind of dispute. Uh, uh, that's a red flag if a lawyer doesn't know what you're talking about when you're talking about escrow. Have them call me. I'll give them, I'll give them one. Uh, I'll probably draft one and put it in rough drafts or something. Uh, I didn't notice anything in reference time of the essence yet. Yeah, it's on page one in bold. Uh, you might have missed that because, uh, you know, I was reading the contract. It's very boring. But um it basically says uh, time of the essence is kind of South Carolina case law because the magic words are in the contract on page one under time in section one. That means the uh, deadlines mean what they say they are. All attorneys to be super busy right now. Any recommendation attorney to help with drafting addendums or helping clients with legal questions? Uh, South Carolina Bar has a lawyer referral service. Um, 800, you know, you can Google it or... Uh, but it's 800-868-2284, South Carolina Bar Lawyer Referral Service, 800-868-2284. $50 consultation fees for the attorneys in there. But, uh, you know, if you're having a problem with attorneys, say, look, uh, I love to use you for closing, but you're so busy, I can't get a hold of you. You know, attorneys are running a business just like you. If they get complaints from people that are referring business to them, if I was the attorney, I would listen to you and try to help you out. Maybe they need to hire a new attorney. Uh, from South Carolina School of Law to help them out. Um, or call the hotline. We can help you with some stuff with addendums. Uh, we can't really help clients too much uh, because they're not members and our insurance is, we're only insured for uh, helping you guys as members. Agents still think the earnest money is automatically returned to the buyer if the seller does not do the mandated items on the repair procedure. Everyone's still operating. Yeah, that's, um, that's going to get somebody sued or facing the real estate commission or ethics charges. So earnest money, real estate commission says if a broker has the earnest money, uh, the broker is going to hold that money forever um, until the party sign a piece of paper or a judge signs a piece of paper. And if you've got a broker dispersing other than that, they're going to read their name on the real estate commission website and be paying a fine to the real estate commission. So use attorneys, use escrow agreements, uh, and then you can do exactly what you want to do. Uh, 518 states the intention of release that any responsibility of a contract or sin and null and void if it'll affect. Yeah, so 518 basically, uh, like Jack was saying, um, it releases it. It says nobody's going to sue anybody. Uh, everybody's going to move on with their lives. We're getting short on time. I'll stay on here, but I, you know, we're supposed to be done by 1130. I'll stay on here and cover the forms if anybody wants to listen, but I did say 1130. So if you need to leave, I understand. Last question. 
you're provided an inspection report as a seller, can you share that inspection report if the buyer walks away? Um, here's kind of what I say about the inspection report. So um, some of these inspectors in the past have argued that's their intellectual property and they could enforce it. Now, inspectors that sue realtors for violating their intellectual property, probably not ever going to use them again. Nobody in your broker. So it's kind of hand, you know, biting the hand that feeds you for the, but what I would do is if uh, you have an inspection report, you read it, um, maybe you update the seller disclosure, maybe you get another inspector to come in there and say, well, that inspector was wrong. It's not really a problem in this house and you keep that document. If you're talking about sharing it to other buyers, it's probably safer to say, hey, look, uh, you know, Byron King Home Inspection Services inspected the house back in uh, February. Uh, if you wanna use him, he might give you a, a discount because he's already inspected the house and let the buyer and buyer agent uh, go, go there and talk to Byron King Home. And I might say, hey, I need to go back out there and make sure everything's the same. It was a month ago, but a lot of things can change in a month. But I will give you a discount. I usually charge 500 bucks. I'll do it for half price because I'm already, I'm just going to go out there and, and look at it again. I'll give you a discount. So that's how I would handle that. All right, then uh, pressing forward, I'll go back to sharing the screen. So 391, this is a good form. It covers, uh, you know, the seller getting the deed restrictions, uh, covenants and restrictions, it covers who's going to pay for a survey. You guys aren't on the beach, but that's what that Coastal Tide and Wetlands Act. It's good for backup clauses. So if you need to do a backup, bingo, here's your backup clause. It's already pre-printed. Uh, agent disclosure. This is where you could... Um, Disclose your spouse, uh, your son, your daughter, uh, your cousin is buying the house. Soil and water test. Uh, this is a way to um, check out the water quality, check out the septic tank, that sort of stuff. Permits. Uh, if you need to get permits for some sort of, uh, you know, a dock or something like that on Lake Wiley, this is, you could use that. Seller financing, you probably want to use an attorney for seller financing, but there is a pre-printed basic seller financing clause. Um, here's where you could disclose information about the buyer's lender. Uh, FERPTA, this is the, uh, if you got somebody that's um, selling a house in uh, Ballantyne and they're from Germany or France or China, um, it basically puts them on notice about all those issues. Hazardous materials is a way to help you from getting sued about uh, you know, South Carolina up that way, you might have some radon, you might have some mold. This is another way to help keep from getting sued. So 391 is a good form. It's got a lot of clauses you may want to use. Um, 504, this is the most hated form we've gotten. Uh, I'll offer a award for anybody that can make this form work better. Uh, Forms Committee is updating this form a little bit, kind of nibbling around the edges, but it's still going to be just, this form does a lot in one page, so it's very uh, complex. This is for the buyer that needs to sell their house in New York and able to buy in South Carolina. It basically says, hey, um, I got to sell my house in New York. Um, I can sell my house up to the day of closing or this thing sunset. So a seller would probably want it to sunset, right? You got to sell your house in New York uh, 30 calendar days prior to the closing. I want to make sure you got the money to buy my house. Uh, so the seller would probably want to make this thing sunset. Um, and if it doesn't close, if the house in New York doesn't close by this deadline, um, the buyer can terminate, and then generally the seller can terminate, but there may be a quirky buyer. Say I'm a buyer from New York, but I got $2 million in the bank. I want to sell my New York house, but this house in Valentine is my dream house. Um, I can still pay cash for it if I need to, or I've got a lot of credit. I can still get a loan without selling my house in New York's paid for. I can afford another mortgage. Uh, you could actually make this form uh, where the seller could not... Um, not terminate, or you can make it where the seller can terminate if that another done. But if you had a buyer that had two million dollars in the bank and their house is already paid off, you can make this where the seller cannot terminate. And then it says, Hey, the buyer's gonna try to sell their house in New York, they're gonna keep everybody updated what's going on with the house sale in New York. And then it goes into the important part what happens if another buyer shows up? It's a hot market, um, you're under contract, but you got a backup buyer. And the backup buyer doesn't need to sell their house. They are, they've got cash or they've already sold their house, what have you, they, got, they can afford two mortgages. Um, 
So if the buyer from New York has their house in New York under contract, they stay in first position, right? Say their house in New York is not under contract yet. Seller notifies the buyer, hey, I've got a backup. Uh, they don't need to sell their house in California. Uh, you need to get out of the way unless you're under contract. And I'm like, oh, my house in New York is not under contract. So I guess I got to get out of the way. Um, multiple offers. Uh, this is the um, multiple offer form. It basically, in addition to the government form, this is what you can use to set up multiple offers. It basically says, hey, I'm rejecting everybody's offers. We're setting up a highest and best deadline for multiple offers. Um, that's what this form is for, 312. 314, we beat this thing to death. This is the government form. If you're the list agent, if your seller is not accepting or counteroffering, always send this. Seller rejects and the seller it's expired, you're sending this form. Note the seller doesn't sign it, just the brokerage. 525 is a repair addendum. You can use this for due diligence or repair procedure. It basically says, uh, you know, seller agrees to make these repairs. Buyer agrees that as well, and they move to closing. Um, 518 is the release. This is a, a good form to use because it says nobody's going to sue anybody, like Jack had mentioned. Uh, you can even disperse the earnest money on here. So if the broker's holding the earnest money, this is your favorite form broker in charge. Buyer and seller agree the earnest money is going to get dispersed. You know, $1,000 to the buyer or 500 to the buyer and 500 to the seller or 1,000 to the seller, however they agree to. You could get to this by mediation or self-settlement. Um, I think there was a question about listing. Maybe a list of questions. Um, I don't really remember, but there was a question about listing that I don't remember. Oh, I know what I want to talk about. There's a question about what are the hot topics. So the hot topics on the hotline are MLS clear cooperation policy. So uh, listing agents, you have a job to look after the seller's best interest. So for the regular, average, typical, general seller, uh, their best interests are full market exposure through the MLS going out on IDX data feeds to all the websites because they're going to get the most offers, which is going to generate competition, which is going to generate higher prices and better terms. So now there are some sellers that want privacy, right? They're, uh, you know, they're a celebrity. They you know, play for the Carolina Panthers, but they live in Fort Mill and they want to sell their house. They don't want a bunch of curiosity seekers coming and looking at their house. Maybe they want some privacy. Uh, maybe it's somebody in Rock Hill that's going through a divorce. They want everything kind of on the down low. They don't want signs in their yard, all the neighbors getting in their business. So those sellers might want privacy. So in section... So we're talking about section 13, multiple listings. So for most sellers, their best interest is the multiple listing full market exposure. Now, if a seller says, hey, I want privacy, uh, I'm famous or infamous, um, getting a divorce, I don't want my neighbors knowing that we're selling our house. Uh, you, got, you can handle that with a, without public marketing. They want privacy, you can give them privacy with what's called an office exclusive. That's uh, option two where it's not going in the MLS. That's very rare. Do not use option two just so you have time to get both ends of the transaction because you're looking after yourself, not your seller client. That'll, I'll get you sued. They'll get your brokerage sued. And you can't publicly market, right? They're famous. They're getting a divorce. They want everything you know, quiet. Uh, that means no signs. That means no Facebook. Um, that means no print media, no website. You know, Everything's on the kind of on the down low. If you've got some buyer clients that you know are looking for something in that neighborhood and that price range, you can communicate with your buyer clients within your brokerage. So only the people that are under your broker. So you look at your broker in charge and just the people that are under your broker in charge, that's the only people you can kind of communicate with this. If you start putting on Facebook, then it's not private anymore. And you've just violated, you know, their need for privacy for their divorce or their, their fame. So for most sellers, their best interest is going to be option one. That means uh, you list it and it goes to the MLS within uh, one business day. So don't abuse that. Uh, look after your seller's best interest, which means full market exposure in the uh, MLS and the IDX. And that kind of wraps up the uh, presentation. Again, if you need to reach me, it's our email is just byron at screaltors.org, uh, austin at screaltors.org. Um, the other thing about uh, the MLS, it's also a fair housing issue because 
if you're doing an office exclusive, um, then not all buyers get a chance at the house. And so somebody could argue that's some sort of fair housing violation. So we got our fair housing conference coming up on April 13th. Tara Pitts, the attorney that was on the call uh, today, she'll be handling the hotline in the near future. And she's gonna be the fair housing director trying to make sure that realtors do not get in trouble for fair housing violations. I'll double check the questions. Tara had to log out. Um, somebody had to log out. Uh, one uh, additional question. Should indeed restrictions all HOA docs and financials be provided prior to an agreement? These can easily be loaded in MLS documents. Yeah, that'd be a good idea. What I would do is the seller in the seller disclosure, there's an HOA last page of the seller disclosure. Uh, tell the seller to get their attorney to pull these docs because you don't want to give the wrong documents, right? In South Carolina, HOA rules has to be recorded. So say the seller went to an HOA meeting a month ago has documents for them, but then the next month the HOA met and they increased fees, for example, and the seller's not aware of it. And the seller says, well, the fee is, you know, $500 a month, and now it's $600 a month, they're gonna get sued. So uh, sellers should uh, get their attorney to pull all that information. And, and I would attach it to the seller disclosure. Remember that seller disclosure is your best liability limitation. If the seller disclosure says it, and you don't know it's false, you can't be sued. That went all the way to the South Carolina Court of Appeals and they agreed with the statute and said, you can't be sued if it's in the seller disclosure. Now, seller could be sued for damages and attorney's fees, but it gets you out of the line of thing. So that wraps it up. Any, uh, if you need any questions, Byron at screaltors.org, 803-772-5206, or get in touch with your broker and, and they can email me questions too. Any uh, closing comments? I'll turn it back to you, Tiffany. Thank you so much, Byron. That was very helpful. Gave us a lot of information to digest. I think we have some probably questions on the escrow agreements with attorneys. So Sarah and I will start working on that to make sure that everyone gets answers to questions that they have relative to who in the area will do them. And uh, we really just appreciate the knowledge and uh, the information you've shared because it definitely makes a difference in what we do every day. And you're helping protect our interests and the consumer's interests at the same time, as well as our business. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thanks. Sarah, is there anything else you want to add before we head out? And Byron, we had over 100 people on the call at one point. So you got through to a good number of our agents today and we've recorded it so that we can go back and listen to it as well. So we appreciate that. Yeah, and uh, if I need more uh, on forms, uh, we'll, there are some forms changes coming. Also in Smallwood, we'll do a webinar probably in the next month or so. All our forms videos are at SC Realtors YouTube. So you just Google SC Realtors YouTube and get our channel. That sounds great. Is there any specific nice. form change that you know of that you might want to share before we end our call? So the main one is the uh, release 518. Uh, there'll be some language that basically says, you know, like we talked about, the release says nobody's going to sue anybody. Um, and it will now say, except about earnest money. So it would enable the parties to go haggle about earnest money. So that's the main okay. change. And there's kind of nibbling around the edges, a little wording, but that's the, ma the main change, I think. That, but if you're using an attorney, you don't have to worry about that, right? You just follow the escrow agreement. So that's right. the that's the best recommendation. Thank you so yes, much for your time.